Um, one thing, well, a few things. If anyone needs a seat, there's plenty of seats in the front. And one thing that I forgot to mention this morning is that just before we break for lunch today, um, David McMullen from the NIH is going to uh, take the stage for a few minutes and talk about some NIH funding um, opportunities. Our next speaker is George Church. George is a genomicist, molecu molecular engineer, a Harvard and MIT professor, and co-founder of nine companies. He's been instrumental in developing direct genomic sequencing, molecular, molecular multiplexing, uh, genome engineering technologies, the use of DNA arrays for combinatorial laboratories and assembling large genome seg segments, and optimized CRISPR. Today, George is going to talk to us about technologies for reading and writing brain structures. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have, uh, just while my slides are coming up, just a quick response to, Joey started his uh, talk with something. He wasn't sure how to react to the fact that genomics doesn't do anything. Um, and, and I won't uh, disagree. Uh, in particular, the, the, the uh, form that he described uh, where you do analysis of current populations that is, is flawed if your goal is to see how much you can do with genomics because it, it represents what capabilities we have in our current population, which has been bottlenecked uh, fairly recently in evolutionary terms, and the most common alleles in that population. So it, it avoids, it, it doesn't look at typically the rarest ones where you can find a genetic component for almost everything that was on that list, including asthma, lung cancer, and so forth. And you can intuitively say the genetics is 100 percent if you go far enough back or if you go enough far enough forward. Um, but in current populations, common alleles. So just think of it. Clearly, um, corn plants don't get asthma or lung cancer, so there, and the difference between them and us isn't just uh, what schools they go to. So, uh, anyway, this is my thank you uh, slide and uh, conflict of interest, and I am interested in all the topics today, the wearables, digital and, uh, um, and uh, neurotech. So this is uh, the closest we come to a wearable real-time sensor for genomics. And this is not just reading your home, human genome as it changes from day to day, your immunome and cancer and so forth, but also measuring your environment. Your environment's full of allergens and pathogens and, uh, and uh, um, other bacteria and viruses. And so wouldn't it be great is if we walk through the world, we all are carrying around something that's reading out at real time, the, the water, food, and air. And it gets back to Joy's e example of this, uh, you know, vibration sensor that people were using for turbulence or Waze, W-A-Z-E, uh, for, for traffic, and many other things where, where we're, by sharing our data, we're greatly, I mean, exponentially and hugely impacting other people's uh, ability to, to navigate uh, the world safely. So anyway, so this is a handheld uh, sequencing device where you can start getting sequencing data within about 25 minutes of, of the sample hitting it. Um, it's not quite real time. I mean, I would like it to be faster, I'd like it to be cheaper, more ubiquitous, um, but we're on, that, we're on that path. We're clearly on that path. Um, the, the first uh, patent on this uh, dates back uh, to uh, eight, 1989, so this is the most pathetic sequencing uh, system in that it took so long to arrive, and it's not still fully arrived. But anyway, you might wonder when, uh, when you walk into a room whether somebody sneezing is releasing some, nothing at all, like a neural reflex. Or, or something deadly like Ebola, okay? And part of the reason that we have amazing technologies like handhold wearable sequencers is that we deviated from Moore's Law. We are, you know, uh, rebels. Uh, we did not follow the law. Uh, and the, the law was right basically uh, doubling every 1.5 years or maybe every two years. Um, and what happened is around, two, we were following it for a while, back to the 70s when I started in this field, but around 2003, 2004, which we changed that, um, uh, and we needed to, because it, otherwise it would have taken six decades to get to an affordable genome, instead it took about six years. And I would argue that the main thing that we, we the main reason this happened is we were inheriting a lot of uh, 
really great stuff from the adjacent field of microfabrication and, and electronics, and also um, this concept of multiplexing, which was um, not always appreciated even in, in the electronics world, but this is invented by Thomas Edison, pro probably before him as well, but uh, a patent on, on uh, t using telegraph cables to transmit uh, multiple uh, messages in both directions simultaneously. And the idea in molecular terms is to be able to do many molecular reactions, millions to billions or possibly more, in a single tube or in a single flow cell or basically in the same uh, vessel. And you can do this both for synthesis and sequencing and a variety of other things. So whenever, you, whenever we see a new uh, bit of biology or new biotechnology, we say, can we multiplex that or can we multiplex it higher? Now, one of the one of the multiplexing that we do is editing, and editing is in the news a bit, uh, mostly, and I think uh, uh, not entirely justified, there's an obsession with uh, the one in the upper right there, uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, I, 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 I love all my babies and all the, everybody else's babies, and there are at least nine editors out there right now, uh, actually a tenth, of the, 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 uh, which is AAV-based, um, and they, what they do is they scan through the genome in a random way. They run up and down the line randomly, forgetting which ones they've seen before until they finally hit the right one, and then they'll do their business, They're either cutting it or more elegantly recombining it. If they just cut it, they make a mess, and that's uh, what we often these days call editing, but really the higher standard is precise editing. So to give an example of multiplexed editing, not just one gene at a time, one gene, one cell, one genome, but 62 at once, we were newcomers to this field. We were invited, we were invited by the, the uh, pioneers uh, in the mid-1990s. This was a big idea of taking humanized pig organs and, and transplanting them. To humanize them, we all knew, or they all knew, that uh, they had to change the immune functions the sugars on the surface of the uh, pig cells, the complement, the clotting, and part of the blood. But they also knew, uh, or began to dawn on them in the late 90s, that there were these endogenous viruses present in, in the pig cells that would go into immune-compromised patients and cause them, um, could cause them to evolve into zoonotic uh, threat like Ebola or uh, HIV or swine flu, uh, to name a few. And so we didn't want this, so we, we aimed our multiplex uh, tools at, uh, at these endogenous retroviruses. And we found, and first we sequenced the genomes. You can't edit without reading. You can't, I mean, some people think you can, but you end up with an even bigger mess. We, re we read the genomes of a few pigs. We figured out that there were 62 in the strain that we were working with, and we knocked out all 62 at once. So it turned out to be a lot easier than we thought, because the record up to that point at least in our hands, was one or two genes at a time. But when you try, uh, sometimes you can find a little bit, get a little bit better, 62 uh, of these. Um, so, and the thing that I find interesting is not only that we can uh, make millions of people's lives better that are uh, waiting and often dying while waiting for transplants, uh, but it offers a, a, a new way of engineering organs that are enhanced in some, some way. If you're desperate for an organ, you can get uh, better uh, t technology than if you're uh, perfectly healthy. And this enhancement might include resistance to cancer, to aging, uh, options for cryopreservation, and pathogens. Just planting that seed of an idea. And here's, uh, we've not only done this in cells, we've now got cute little piglets uh, that are about five months old now that seem to be perfectly healthy, even though we've changed 62 genes at once uh, in their genome. Now, there's another application. Now, now, we're going now to human organs and, and getting at that flow of information that's coming in now because there are millions of people getting their genome sequenced, and almost there's three million differences between you and me and our genomes, and some, most, m many of those uh, mutations are, are what poorly characterized. They may look scary, but you don't know whether they're scary, and these are called variants of unknown significance, or VUSs. So these variants of unknown significance are kind of the plague of the modern emerging um, diagnostics field. And we have a pipeline now that allows us to go from those variants to um, possible cause and effect. 
This is no longer correlation like the study that, that Joey showed where you find uh, poor genetic uh, components. These are, these are people that, uh, um, this is a way that you can introduce a single gene genetic change, whether you find it in the population or not, and you can see what its effect is on essentially every organ in the body without actually engineering humans. You engineer like miniature pieces of humans uh, in these, uh, in these uh, libraries that we can make from transcription factors. I'm not going to go into the gory details, but um, Alex M, a graduate student in the lab, uh, finally assembled all of the human transcription factors. These are the regulatory molecules that allow you to make almost any cell type. And I'll show you, here's an example. These are stem cells in a nice little clump together. They're, they're really small cells that like to hang together. And this is sped up so one day in a few seconds. Um, but the point is that in a day, these things are changing from stem cells into um, uh, these neurons, these neurons that have two uh, poles, bipolar neurons, and they're doing it with very high efficiency and very high uh, conversion rates. So it, it, and, uh, it used to, t some of these protocols would take uh, um, hundreds of days and be uh, a few percentage efficiencies. This uh, takes uh, four days is 98% efficient for a whole variety of different cell types. I'm sure in neurons because that's kind of one of the topics today. Okay. Now what was, so these are, these are a cell type, but we want to uh, make them into organs or organoids. They're sometimes more, uh, 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 they're, they're called in, in humility. Um, and, but they can, they can have these beautiful structures uh, that you can see here where, where they have many layers of differentiated different kinds of neurons and many other uh, brain uh, components. But they were missing a critical component was vasculature, the capillaries that bring in oxygen and food and take out waste. And, uh, and we now have, have figured out how to do that using the methods that I just described uh, from Alex. Mm. And here's an example of that pipeline, that variant of unknown significance, where you could take an unknown base pair change, or a number of them. Very often, if you have a sick kid, you might have a number of candidate positions in their genome that you want to check out. Here's one where uh, uh, our collaborator, Bill Poo, had found um, in this child was uh, cardiac myopathy that, uh, that, there, that one of the candidate genes shown here, there were clearly three million candidates, but this one was one of the top uh, choices, was a single gene mutated on the X chromosome of this boy um, in the TAS gene. And we took um, cells from PGP1 right up there at the top. Joy mentioned that uh, we have this project called Personal Genome Project. It's the only one in the world that allows uh, open sharing, the kind of sharing I think that many people in this room are embraced, but open sharing of human medical and genomic data and cells. So importantly, these are uh, some of the most characterized cells on the planet. And, and that, that we have many different, uh, that's worldwide now, uh, approval for human subjects. And uh, so they know what they're getting into. And PHP-1 happens to be me. The IRB asked me, to, uh, the, the, the rule is that it's unethical for me to experiment on my students, but apparently it's ethical for them to experiment on me. And so, uh, so that's what PGP-1 is from my arm. And the stem cells turn in, uh, are first edited um, precisely now, not just making a mess. So we get rid of that 1G. And then we, that's editing the genes. And then we edit the, uh, now we uh, change the epigenetics, which is the way that the genes play out. In other words, the kinds of cells they are. And we change them now from stem cells into, in, into cardiac tissue. So it's a, a, this beautiful sarcomere organization there's repeating structure that's, that is not only morphologically, but dynamically, it contracts about uh, 60 times a minute. Um, and, and you can see the normal in the far left there, um, and then one base pair change, and we confirm this by sequencing the whole genome, which students think nothing of these days. They just, if they want to check that they change one base pair, they, they just sequence the whole six billion base pairs to make sure. And, and that's what's in the, the second lane over from the left. It's deranged in its uh, morphology, its physiology, its biochemistry, in exactly the way of the cardiomyopathy, therefore proving cause and effect for this base pair. 
Now, we also want to check that the, the, the structure of these cells is normal, that it, it represents the tissue. So you can see each of those dots was not changing in position, but changing in color. And then we can, the computer can reformat it. And this is telling you every dot, there is a single messenger RNA molecule, and we know the name of it. So now, when you look in a microscope, you're no longer, uh, it, it's no longer a question of what you're looking at. It's not like it's blue or red. It's this is the messenger RNA number 2000. And we want to integrate many different types of data, including uh, you know, wearable data and so forth. So, we, so behavior is essentially the, the sort of data that we might get from wearables. Um, but we want to have activity measurement, um, uh, how the brain is connected, the connectome, how, how all the cells developed, how they got to where they are, and then how the expression, which was what I just showed you. The expression is the RNA and proteins as little single pixels uh, within cells. And uh, Adam Marblestone is one of my uh, colleagues uh, who's really helped uh, uh, think about this and publish uh, ideas about this. Uh, so Tony Zador, uh, a collaborator on one of our grants that we have together, has shown that you can really establish connections in the brain all the way from one side of the brain to, to the other using the kind of in situ uh, methodology I showed where instead of the colors being related to the name of the RNA molecule, um, it is related to barcodes that can be inserted either by virus or other ways. Um, and those can tell you that, that the same process, which might extend uh, from one side of the brain to the other, is from the same cell. And so that kind of barcoding is very powerful. So finally, I want to talk about brain activity as a function of time. This is the most speculative thing, but I think it leads us in a direction where wearables can be extremely um, pervasive throughout our entire body, where we can read and write um, to every cell in the body simultaneously. Um, that seems implausible if we're talking about electrodes. Having 86 billion electrodes for 86 billion human neurons would be uh, crowded, uh, 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 to understate it slightly. Um, so this is a way of using uh, synthetic biology to measure influence and measure read and write uh, activity. And, and I'm just going to quickly just show you, just so you've seen it, uh, four examples where we have either DNA polymerase, which is a beautiful nano machine that reads and writes uh, like a stepper motor, but one that's very smart where it knows uh, it's responsive to the precise ACs, Gs, and Ts at any position. So we've used that for sensing uh, sodium and DNA and calcium. And then we've used the, the Cas9 as the CRISPR that everybody talks about. Cas1 and 2 is the behind the scenes uh, cousin you never talk about that um, does the recording. So anyway, this is, this is an example of polymerase that we use where we could encode the presence of calcium as mismatches in DNA rather than A base pairing with T normally and G with C normally. We sometimes get G with T and that mismatch rate can be regulated by calcium. Um, here's using Cas1 and 2 uh, <coughs> for uh, for uh, encoding. I'm not going to go through the details of how we did it, but Cas1 and 2 is, is, is evolved to do exactly this, to record the presence of viruses you want to remember later and kill. In this case, we're recording uh, information on a, on a classic uh, series of photographs of a horse galloping. Uh, and then Cas9, the, the, cat, the CRISPR you've heard about more, we can use this for encoding developmental lineage. So e what these have in common is we're measuring time. We're turning time into a digital recording in the form of DNA. You can think of it as a molecular tape, tape, or tape, or tape recorder. And then finally, I bring us full circle back to this handheld um, wearable device um, that, is, that is using a polymerase uh, here. Um, as an as a, as a interface between the ion channels where we're measuring sodium chloride going through, um, and it's modulated by uh, nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. So I think something like this will, will soon morph into something that's wearable and can read all sorts of things. So I just want to uh, thank, thank uh, my collaborators on this. I've thanked a few of the students and postdocs already. These are some of the, the, the principal investigators involved in our uh, uh, Center of Excellence grant and our two transformative awards, on, mostly on um, brain and brain organoids. Thank you. Do we do questions or?
That's a first. <laughs> I have a question for you. Uh, how many people here have their genome sequenced? Wow, that's, that's almost a record, except for the meetings I go to where they cut their genome sequence. <laughs> but 99% but of, of well-educated, wealthy uh, audiences is 1% or less. Yeah. So good for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? So what do you recommend to get our DNA sequence from? Oh, who, who, who would you get it? Well, so um, there are many um, groups offering very um, inexpensive sequencing, and you kind of get what you pay for. Um, so usually that means you're getting 0.001% uh, of your genome. They don't, they don't advertise it as a, here, get your 0.001% of your genome. But if you, your full genome, probably the least expensive one is Veritas Genetics, which is a local one, full disclosure. It was on my disclosure slide. Um, but uh, it's $1,000, including genetic counseling. But there, there are a few others that, that, that might provide the, the similar service. Yeah. Ah, so the time resolution of the various recording methods that I described. So, so some of these are uh, only demonstrated in vitro so far, um, but I can still estimate time. Uh, so the, for calcium, um, the kind of recording speed we would like, and it's, and, and, uh, it's obtainable with uh, things like GCAMP6, is on the order of hertz. It's uh, like one per second because that's kind of the time scale in vivo of interesting calcium events, especially in the brain. Um, th for the, the, the sodium, we're working at kilohertz range, but the, the DNA that modulates it is working closer to hertz range, um, and kilohertz isn't even enough for, for most um, neural systems. Uh, but there are uh, in vivo detectors that are now work at tens uh, to hundreds of kilohertz um, um, from uh, and then uh, the Cas9 and is on the order of the, uh, the develop, uh, you know, 20 day development of a mouse, and the Cas1 and 2 is somewhere in between. It's, it's in the order of hours. So you can cover all these ranges because each have their own modalities. If you're talking about developmental biology, it's very long range. If you're talking about sodium potassium channels, it's, it's tens of kilohertz. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, do I see a path forward for changing the tagging for readout so that we can do it in, in vivo real time? Is that the question? Yeah. So uh, but yes. Uh, so I mean, what uh, most, so the, the, two, the two main things that I showed was one was the kind of the handheld detector for food, air, and water. Uh, and that is um, close to real time, meaning 25 minute delay. Um, but it's not, it's not internal. I mean, it's, you have to take it external uh, to, the, to measure it. Um, all the things in C2 were, uh, were destructive in a certain sense. You have to take the, the, the tissues out of, out of the body to, to measure them. Um, but, we're, but we're working in a direction where um, the molecular recording devices we have will be able to read out optically. Um, not, not through optical fibers, um, which is just as bad as electrodes in a certain sense in the crowding problem, fitting them into the brain, but uh, via the circulatory system, um, which is pervasive. There's essentially one capillary per neuron in the brain, so it's a really excellent way of interfacing uh, optically. And also the optics doesn't go very far. You know, four centimeters is heroic and you need a pretty big light source, but just going the, the, the 10 microns across the endothelial cell is pretty easy. Yep. Uh, uh, real time monitoring of circular, uh, circulating in the DNA. Uh, you know, because of the device, you know, we have for. Ah, yeah. So the question is can we look at circulating tumor DNA um, real time? To some extent, I mean, obviously we're all going to be in a rush if we're at risk for cancer, but the, the time frame for cancer, even with these very aggressive methods, is probably still on the order of weeks to months, not, not seconds. Nevertheless, it might be good to do that. You'll, you'll have to deal with a huge 
false positive or current state of ignorance. I mean, you're constantly getting tumors and constantly killing them. Now, a lot of those tumors aren't releasing DNA into the, into the media or into the bloodstream. Um, you know, so I think the answer is yes, you could do that. It may not be the thing that's limiting uh, cancer or, right now. In fact, I think the main strategy for cancer long term is preventative. It's that you know, our, our genes cause cancer. There are animals that get almost no cancer, even though they have more cell divisions than we do. Um, and, and, and we know how to prevent cancer in mice, which you get cancer at a high rate. So I think prevention is, is the underrepresented but most powerful route for much of medicine. Um, but monitoring is the topic here today, and I agree. We could do monitoring real time of, of cancer. Uh, and proteins might be even more powerful since, there, since there's an amplification from DNA to RNA to protein. Also, a lot of cells that are not releasing DNA into the cell are releasing proteins to the cell. So I think that's a, a very promising way of doing real-time monitoring that David Walt and others were pursuing. Any other questions for George? I haven't noticed any underhyping, uh, and you know, I I, I I don't think I'm part of the problem. I mean, even though you know, I was one of the many co-inventors and made a lot of money from it. Uh, I've consistently said how there are multiple ways of doing editing, and and Cas9, CRISPR in general, the entire uh, set of homologs. Uh, uh, has the, the severe problem, it makes a double strand break, which means that it's hard to make precise edits. Um, and it also, uh, uh, as a consequence, is somewhat toxic. And, and anyway, there, there, there are you know, half dozen ways of doing precise edits that I think will uh, grow up now that as people become uh, more aware of the limitations of CRISPR, which I was unfortunately painfully aware of from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.